Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by Wistia. Take control of your video marketing with powerful tools and analytics built specifically for business. Go to wistia.com slash twist to get your free Wistia account today. And by Mandrill, the best way to send transactional email from the people who make MailChimp. Sign up today at mandrill.com. And by Amazon Web Services. Get the resources you need to easily get started with AWS Activate, a new global program for startups, including... AWS credits, training, developer support, a startup community forum, and special offers from third parties. Learn more and sign up at aws.amazon.com slash activate. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. It's Jason Calacanis. This is This Week in Startups, the program where we talk about technology, venture capital, entrepreneurship, angel investing, all those great things. Today on the program, Gabriel Snyder is with me and Sarah Lacey of Pando Daily. It's going to be an amazing episode. Stick with us. That's what it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Yeah. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. It's Jason Calacanis. Welcome to This Week in Startups, the program where we talk about startups, technology, all that kind of great stuff. We do two shows per week, and uh, you're tuned into the News Roundtable, which we do on Fridays at 1 p.m. Pacific uh, here in Culver City and sometimes out of San Francisco. And um, today on the program, Sarah Lacey from Pando Daily is with me and Gabriel Snyder, formerly of the Atlantic Wire and now with a little startup called Inside.com as his chief Content officer, welcome to the program for the first time, Gabriel Snyder. Thank you. Exciting week for you guys at Inside. And yeah. by you guys, I mean me and you. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty funny, a self-referential uh, thing there. How do you uh, think we did? How did yeah, let's talk about how we did. <laughs> but actually, even better, uh, Sarah Lacey, uh, the uh, formerly of TechCrunch and uh, author of many great books, uh, and now with Pando Daily. Uh, you, you got to watch it from the outside. I mean, what did you think of uh, how we did this week with Inside.com? Well, I think it's really exciting. I mean, I think it's, you know, a typical Jason Calacanis move. It's very insightful about where media is going, but you claim to be doing something no one else has done before, which is true and not true. So, you know, media companies are the ultimate iterative startups. You have to put great stuff up every single day. So launch tells you almost nothing. Well, oh, I see. La yes, the launch of the product the launch. will tell you not nothing. Diplomatic, launch. Sarah. Yeah, very <laughs> diplomatic. The launch tells many things. Yes. Um, <laughs> Well, it was uh, you know, um, I was. I think you're more interesting than Circa. I mean, a lot of people compared the two. I think you're more interesting than them. Yeah, I'm. You know, I'm, it was that was actually one of the more interesting angles of the whole thing because I'm an investor in Circa, and when I invested in Circa, just so people know, Matt and I talked, the founder, about the launch ticker, which was the minimal viable product hiding in plain sight right. of Inside. I tested it for over a year, and he was like, "Yeah," I was like, "Do you consider that competitive with what you're doing?" He's like, "No, they're both summarizing content and sort right. of trying to build a new product." Um, and certainly inside is a lot bigger and wider, so it is sort of competitive, but they think they're doing original journalism, and we're clearly just doing curation. What do you think, Gabriel? Well, I think there's a, you know, a lot of these news aggregators that we've been lumped in with are trying to re-engineer the news story, right? They're, they're, they're doing these object-oriented journalism or, you know, uh, something that looks really pretty and is interactive and whatnot and is basically saying, you know, what is the best, best form for our phone? I think we're doing something very different. We're trying to point people to the existing great journalism that's out there. We're more of a middleware than, a, than trying to, you know, displace um, all of the, the 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 great you know newspapers and, and and websites that are already publishing stuff because the core problem that people have that want to go find the best journalism is that it's all over and actually the media companies are doing everything to confuse you and direct you to places that you don't want to go uh, Sarah I would say that Pando Daily is not one of those publications that's trying to do upworthy business insider type right. headlines and those kind of things. Does it put you at a disadvantage as a publisher because you're kind of old school in your approach that we're not going to do a link baiting kind of uh, dishonest headline and we're not going to, you know, sort of engage in slideshows? What is your strategy with Pando Daily in regards to this? And what do you think of our pitch of, you know, Inside tries to unspin that? 
Right. So I think those things are always temporary. I mean, when you talk to Jonah Peretti, he talks about his big fear at Huffington Post was so much hinged on SEO, and they absolutely won that battle, but he just didn't think that would remain the battle. And so, you know, it's interesting because he put himself in the exact position again with BuzzFeed where he's so relying on Facebook. I mean, I just, I, I have a very old school approach to this that I think actually long term makes us more defensible. People come to Pando because we have a trusted brand and they want to read what we're talking about. Every single day, one of our, if not our most trafficked page is the homepage. And people come to our homepage and read the site. They're not coming in through links or SEO or social as much as they are just coming to the site every day. And to me, that's really how you build a long-term media brand. People aren't like, you know, ac accidentally tripping over a coffee table and, you know, a page of fortune is opening up and, you know, flashing in front of their eyes. I mean, if you look at the great general business brands of the past, they were built on trust. They were built on reputation and people coming there for context and to understand what they need to know that day. And, you know, that's what we're building. That's why we charge much higher CPMs. I mean, this isn't just sort of a high-minded journalist view. I mean, it's helped in our business. You know, we charge more because we have an influential audience who's in the industry, who's coming to us for this news. We're not tricking people to come. Yeah, and so... Gabriel, when you um, were at The Atlantic previously, your last gig, mm -hmm. obviously a pretty notable bro Facebook bubble that emerged at the end of the last year, it has this distracting quality. I mean, when you see a page like our, you know, our Justin Bieber, Zach Galifianakis reblog of a Funny or Die video, got something like 5 million views, and it's impossible to ignore those kinds of things. We did a... Um, a really good story, if I can say so myself, of uh, finding the guy who was behind Viral Nova, which went from zero to about um, stop doing the thing so they're good at. So what percentage do you think is at a, if you went through like, you know, three or four top places, say The Atlantic yeah. Wire, Business Insider, and then all the way to BuzzFeed, what percentage at each of those places do you think is spent on the marketing social effort versus the actual creation of great journalism? It's it's low. It's low. It's not a it's not a it's not a it's not a isolated isolatable thing. I mean, you it's think not at Business Insider or BuzzFeed. It's low. I think I as think an organization, it's blood. high. But I think I think I think what you're trying to do as an organization is well, basically I mean, inculcate it in a writers and say what this is what I mean, does well. Sorry, think about no more things that do well. All right, Nicholas so Sarah, let me ask Sarah. Slideshow sure. of yeah. being late for a flight, like that is all marketing. It's like, like, come on. You, the conception of that piece is marketing. Is, is okay, that but what you, so let's say, say we that? took somebody who's Sarah spent somebody who spends ten hours a day working on Business Insider or Huff Post. One of those journalists, how much are they spending, Sarah, in terms of those 10 hours on the marketability and socialization of what they're doing versus the creation of it? I think it's impossible to pull apart. I think yeah. if you're working for Huffington Post or BuzzFeed or Business Insider, a core part of your job is that something has to be clickable. So the story you're thinking of doing, the headline you're thinking of doing, even the Marissa piece that Business Insider did, as everyone that everyone hails as sort of their journalism moment, the reason they did it was because pieces on Marissa drove tons of traffic. So I think it, it is woven into their fabric. It is their playbook. I just, I think it's impossible to pull apart. I agree with you, Sarah. Like they see it as journalism. Yeah. Yeah, but I think if you look at those places, I'm guessing the amount of research that went into the Marissa piece, mm -hmm. the research component and the writing component, I think even on a big piece like that was no more than two thirds of the person's time and then one third of it was on the marketing and the titling and everything. That I think you overestimate pieces. journalists and math. I mean, I, they, there's there's someone running analytics and figuring out what's doing well. But you know, I think when you're running an an, an operation like this, when I've run places and you want gawk, to gawk Gawker or, or or the Wire, and I'm trying to grow our site's traffic, then you know you're constantly giving messages to say how do you you know let's look at what's working, learn, learn, constantly get a feedback loop. And I think that that feedback loop can is positive, but it can have it can you know run away and it can really drag you away from the mission, and that's really the danger that you know that I think particularly the last quarter kind of phased. I mean, you see some of the you know some of the big time media organizations that are trying to think how can we compete with Upworthy and why does you know the Washington Post want to be in the Upworthy it's a business? Thing. I think there, it's a fundamentally different business than what we do. Yeah. I mean, I don't share stats with my team. We don't look at them. You know, I mean, I look at them as the CEO at sort of an overall directional basis, but on a story by story basis. This I don't. And like, 
What I like about us is, you know, we're following the data of what our readers are telling us as much as any publication, but what our readers like the most are long form, very smart investigative stories. It's not our nice to have on top of our kitten videos, it is our kitten videos. But, and so the more we cheapen those stories with link bait, we actually totally detract from our model and our business. And I just think all of these businesses are fundamentally like, what, are, what is your company based on? What do you make money from? Journalists don't want to think of it that way, but you know, we all have to pay the bills and stay in business. For us, it's influence and having the smartest people reading us. And it's great, because for me as a journalist, I'm completely aligned as a CEO and journalist. I think for publications where it's focused on sheer traffic and having to get to you know 100 million uniques in six months, like if you're trying to pull up an unnatural act, it's like someone who just had a baby and is trying to be unnaturally a size zero. They're getting plastic surgery and it's not sustainable. I mean, yeah. you know, these things you you have to follow the curves of nature on growth, or you're not going to have a sustainable business. I don't know. I just think it's that simple. What is the impact though when everybody is going after the same pool of advertisers mm -hmm. because clearly when you look at the link baiting sites um, you know even despite their link baiting and have big numbers I see American Express or I see IBM mm -hmm. I see those advertisers on the link baiting sites as much as I see them on the high quality journal sites so although they might be playing a different game are they not going after the same advertising dollars Gabriel well, ultimately, but I, I, that's the biggest concern I have about this sustainability of this model is that you can generate big audience numbers, but the advertisers don't want that. They want the you know the smaller, more influential, more higher end you know audience. And so, when you go sort of this low end, then you know you're either going to be playing a bait and switch where you're selling right. millions of uniques on cat videos to sell you know to to yep. an Amex. All right. Um, a fascinating discussion. We could talk about media all day, but I'd love uh, to. exactly when we get back from. Uh, I have just one thing. Yeah. I have one thing to add to before we move on. So when you're talking about the media buyers, I do think that's interesting because we we talk to a lot of the same people, and we're in you know very early in those conversations because we're very young. But you know, so far when we've talked to people who are those same buyers, we're talking to a different department of the company. So like we're rarely talking to the like 20 year old media buyer just because our audience isn't that big. Like we're frequently actually talking to the CMO or sometimes I'm even talking to the CEO of a company who's a, a reader of ours and wants them to get more involved. So we just have to be more strategic in almost doing more of um, like a, a partnership, like, you know, what do you guys, what kind of content do you want to be next to? Stuff about e-commerce companies, great. We'll do a special report on e-commerce companies. We'll do a panel monthly around e-commerce. You're not going to control our content. It's not sponsored content in that sense. So it's almost more like a strategic marketing conversation yeah. we're having than an ad conversation. So sometimes I think it's the same companies, but a different person in those companies did the deals. Yeah, makes total sense. All right. Uh, when we get back, Microsoft uh, has a new CEO. Maybe Google is uh, selling Motorola uh, after buying it just recently, and um, Box is going to file for their IPO plus the launch of the week when we get back from this important message. Hey, Mandrill is the transactional email service from our friends at MailChimp. What is transactional email? That's the email that a startup sends to you like, hey, change your password. Hey, you got a friend request. Hey, somebody commented. Hey, somebody posted a follow comment. All those great emails that re-engage you with a service, uh, those are in this category called transactional email. They created a category for it because it was so hard to do well. And then companies and services emerged to address this because startups were spending an ungodly amount of time trying to figure out how come their password reset wasn't getting into people's inbox and was getting caught in spam. Uh, well, those, as you know, those spam servers at Google, at Yahoo, at AOL, they're getting very, very stringent. They're not going to let transactional email or marketing messages through every time. But if you get a partner like Mandrill, they are focused 100% on making sure these messages get through, and they're trusted by these services. I know because I use it, and I've used it for a while now. It comes from the people who use who do MailChimp, which is a great service as well. Um, and you can get really good real-time analytics on your phone, whether it's iOS or Android, and see how many of these transactional emails are getting opened, et cetera, and then optimizing them so they get opened more frequently, all those kind of things. Um, it's really key for re-engaging customers having great email, and the pricing is incredible. First 12,000 emails per month are always free, and after that, you just pay on a usage basis. You never pay for more than you use. They're not going to try to lock you into some 20-month 20 20 or 20-year contract. Go ahead and sign up at mandrill.com, M-A-N-D-R-I-L-L, mandrill.com, and thank Mandrill App, A-P-P, on Twitter. 
Mandrill, thank you uh, from Jason Calcanis for uh, providing me with great transactional email service as well. I do appreciate it. All right, listen, uh, big week in the, you know, just from the big companies. Uh, Microsoft maybe has a new CEO, uh, the enterprise and cloud chair. Uh, Satya Nadell is, uh, according to Bloomberg, going to be the CEO. I don't, I don't know if that's been confirmed, but what, what do you think of that, uh, Sarah? Is, is this confirmed yet, or and, and who is this person? I've never even heard of them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's interesting. It shows how Microsoft's relevance has really changed in the tech world. The fact that we none of us know if this is actually confirmed. <laughs> like, we don't know who this guy is. We've never met him. The fact that, you know, reporters weren't digging this out well in advance and, you know, watching it avidly. I mean, to me, like, I don't know the guy well at all. I don't super closely cover Microsoft. But I think what strikes me is for a very long time, Microsoft has had sort of a tug of war in the company and admit investors, too, of whether it should really be a consumer company or an enterprise cloud company. And a lot of people felt one reason that Ballmer was so bad over the last decade was that he fundamentally didn't get consumer. I mean, we've seen the clips where he didn't get why the iPhone was a threat. The one thing they did do well, Xbox, they could have made into this major living room play. They failed at that. They've never had a great consumer web strategy. Um, I think the fact that they're picking a cloud guy, you know, you can look at it one way and say they're playing to their strengths. And you can look at it another way and say, you know, Microsoft is really going to continue at its heart to be a business software company. Yeah, and they've had record, record revenue in the last couple of quarters. How do you look at Microsoft, Gabriel? Uh, similarly, I mean, it looks like if this guy is the new CEO, they're basically giving up on consumer, right? I mean, they're saying that they're picking the cloud and enterprise guy, yeah. and he's got a great track record there. I, I forget the numbers. It was something like 12 to 20 billion or something in yeah. revenue that he that he, he oversaw in the last yeah. few years. I mean, that's an incredible record, and, and you know, and that's the space that they're going to be strong in. Um, you know, the other little bit of news that I saw this week on Microsoft is they're hiding the, uh, the tiles on Windows. Eight. They're kind of pushing that further and further. And, you know, that was the most innovative part of Windows yeah. 8. It was the thing that, you know, every it was ahead of the curve. It was actually one of the, the, the exciting technological things. But they've got a massive enterprise business. And I think that this, you know, if this is the direction, then they're going to try to defend that. Yeah, and what's interesting is, I just saw this week as well, that the Surface 2 had great sales. Like, they're actually growing sales of that product. People are actually starting to like it. And it does seem like, Really, just anecdotally, I've seen the Surface on airplanes, and I've seen it like literally a guy take it out of his, you know, put it in the, uh, you know, bucket in front of me on the TSA. Like, that's usually my way of telling yeah. like how <laughs> these devices are doing if I see them in the wild. And the Surface uh, is a pretty fine product, I'll say. I'm not, like, being paid or sponsored by Surface to do that. Um, I've used it. It's a great product. It's it's really, like, the interesting intersection of consumer tablets and um a laptop, yeah, which I think actually might be again like Microsoft is seemingly with design starting to almost leapfrog Apple in a way. Like yeah. the the tile interface felt like it was further along than say iOS six, sure, and the you know standard Windows interface, and then the Surface actually seemed bizarrely to be a better iPad, although it didn't have the yeah. same fit and finish. So what do you think of that? You know, if well, are they getting better, uh, Sarah? I think it depends on what you use a tablet for. I think everyone wants to make this sort of an all-in-one device that does the same thing for everybody. I mean, if you use the tablet more for a business functionality, which a ton of people do, I mean, Workday will tell you a ton of their software is being run on tablets that sales guys are carrying around and medical professionals. I think probably the Microsoft Surface is going to be a better fit. I think if you use a tablet like I do, which is you hand it to your three-year-old on a long flight to get him entertained, like what what is he going to do with the Surface? Like I feel like I don't need Excel. to roll a tablet in my life. <laughs> I know, we can do, he can catalog all of his toys for three hours. Um, I feel like I have no role for a tablet in my life. My iPads, like my kids play with, um, you know, if I'm on a long trip, I might watch a movie, but otherwise I have an air. I mean, I just, I still don't know why I need, frankly, an iPad or a Surface. So yeah. I, I guess I'm sort of nowhere in the tablet revolution, but you know, I, I think they're, they're different devices for different people. It's whether you think of it fundamentally as mobile or a laptop. I right. tend to talk about the iPad as a mobile device. You know, when I talk about mobile commerce or things like that, I'm usually looping in iPads to that. Yeah. And a lot of times research analysts will be like, no, 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 it's just a smaller computer. And I think that points to the fundamental distinction and why we can't really talk about these as one category. Yeah. Interestingly, this is an interesting rumor I heard, and obviously I, I get some interesting rumors some, from time to time. And this one is 
the reason why they named the iPad, the most recent iPad, the Air, mm -hmm. to confuse the hell out of everybody with the MacBook Air, which is their phenomenal laptop that we all use, um, is that they're going to offer a keyboard with the iPad at some point, or like an Apple-made iPad keyboard, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which sounds absolutely nuts because they have very much been trying to make those two product lines. But that it does almost make logical sense that maybe these things are they're trying to converge them because they gave them the same name. It's yeah. very bizarre, you know. Without Steve Jobs, they don't know what's going on because they seem to have lost their ability to name things. Not yeah. that they were ever good at it. What, what do you think of that theory? Well, have you ever seen the encyclopedia, the, the the chart that shows the evolution of the horse? And it has like the really, really tiny dog-sized horses yeah. and the big mammoth horses. I don't yeah. know if those exist, but let's just pretend. Yeah. You know, they, I feel like we're in that that mode right now right. of these screens we can touch. And right. we're going from itty, itty, bitty ones, which are the iPhones and the, and the yeah. smartphones, all the way up to these enormous, giant, you know, tabletop pa tablets right. and we're still figuring out where do they fit in I'm, I'm i'm exactly with you sarah i find i found that the air and the iphone are eating up all of my use and the tablet is really falling by the wayside and that might be where we where we end still up no I think there's still no killer reason we need a tablet. I think there's lots of little small killer reasons and you know this kind of goes into the facebook has a you know um a uh, you know, flip killer now, like uh, flipboard killer now. I mean, it's like, I, I don't know. People love flipboard. Like, I, I don't have a huge need for it in my day, to li day life. There are people who play games on tablets. Again, I don't think that's like a killer app. Like, I think with the phone, it was about being able to have a web browser in your pocket and be able to do emails, yes, but do stuff beyond emails, which was all the BlackBerry did. And that's what made the BlackBerry great. And that's Uber, and that's, you know, accessing the web, and it's everything else. Like, the phone was so obvious, both the BlackBerry version and the iPhone version. And, you know, the Air was obvious. Obviously, a laptop was obvious. But, like, I don't think there's been an obvious, this is why you need a tablet. I said that when the iPad came out, and I was screamed at by all the Ma Apple fanboys, and probably get screamed at again. But, I, I mean, I think that's why you see bifurcation in the market between a Surface and an iPad, and why most people I know... They use their iPads for babysitting. Yeah. Well, it's the best reading device. I mean, I if I'm going to read a 20-page report or a 20-page article, I want my iPad. I don't want it printed out. I don't want it on my phone. I definitely don't want it on a laptop. I want it on an so iPad. So for me, it's the only reason the iPad is not a good reading device is because I never have it with me. I mean, for a while, yeah. I was you got to get the iPad. That, but I have to get up and go get it from the other room because what I have with me all the time is my phone. So yeah. the thing that I have with it's not me mobile. all the time is actually the best reading device. Like yeah. if I have to go up and go to the other room to get it, it's not the best reading device. That's why the I like the iPad mini because the, convenient. I, yeah. the iPad mini is genius. Yeah. Steve Jobs created it to fit in a back jeans pocket. Uh, you know, he always wore jeans and stuff like that. <laughs> the iPad mini, literally, if you have men's jeans that are not, you know, yeah. like the ones Jack wears at Square, like the $800 right. bespoke ones from Paris or whatever he wears. <laughs> like if you just wear regular yeah. jeans, like a normal civilian it will fit in the back pocket. And I used to be able to keep a magazine in my back pocket. Exactly. That's, 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 the that's what I like. The now, mini. here's the question I want you to ask the next time you see someone at the TSA line with a Surface, uh -huh. who bought it? Because oh, I bet you it's the office. It's right. not the personal. Yeah, right. I'd say I still don't see them in the wild. Yeah. I mean, I'm starting, I'm starting to see them in the stuff. wild. I think it is, though, from the office. All right, listen, when I get back from commercial break, we're going to do the uh, launch of the week, and we have three really great candidates for that, new things that launched in the world. And Tom Perkins... Um, just keeps. Oh God, we got to talk yeah. about that. We got to. Just, talk keep, about just that. keeps digging and digging. <laughs> the, the, and we'll, ex, we'll explain exactly when you can uh, evoke the Holocaust in your Never. metaphor. And the answer, <laughs> Sarah just said it. Don't do it. All right, really short listen. segment. Exactly, in a really short segment. All right, Wistia, Wistia. Um, I love this Wistia. Um, I went on my Twitter because I was a little frustrated with the uh, YouTube. Because I was like, listen, I want to have a little more control over my videos. This is the God's honest truth. God's honest truth. You can look at my Twitter history. I said, what's the best platform for me to store videos if I want to customize them? Because I wanted to have like a bigger, beautiful uh, experience when people came to This Week in Startups or the launch ticker. I said, who's the best place to host videos? Because I didn't remember. Like, I know there was like Brightcove or something. There's all these big services that were very expensive five years ago. I said, what's like the, the equivalent of like MailChimp for hosting video? Wistia, 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 like literally 50 people in two minutes say you got to use Wistia. So I go check it out. I open an account on the spot. 
put in my credit. I didn't have to put in my credit card. I tell my uh, technical producer here, Brandon, say, throw something up there. She throws it up there. I start seeing the analytics and how beautiful it is. And it is gorgeous. Look at my screen here. I can look at like the Stuart Alsop one and I can see, hey, wait a second. This person watched 80% of the show starting at this link. Why did that happen? I remember I tweeted it from a certain point in the show and that was a Roadrunner user in New York. Oh, this is somebody from Dublin. And then I can actually see uh, we can put like a little roadblock on the cover of the video that says, hey, sign up for the, before it starts playing, sign up for the This Week in Startups mailing list. Well, producer Gina now has thousands of people on that list. And every week, dozens and dozens of people type their email address in. It's like, oh, this was a good interview with Sarah and Gabriel. I will uh, put my email in and get the link. Then they get the next week's to get the next week's. And that's how you build a direct relationship with your customers and own that relationship. Wistia is absolutely fantastic. I love it. Go to wistia.com slash twist, wistia.com slash twist to get your free account. No credit card required. The first five videos are free and the analytics and email addressed um, Roblox and all that kind of stuff is just amazing. Video is super important and Wistia is just awesome um, at doing this and it's super affordable. We've got over 50,000 customers, speaking of which include MailChimp and Blank Label, This Week in Startups, Moz, a bunch of people are using it. Go ahead and sign up today. Thank you to my friends at Wistia for producing a great product again. Any product that I read the ad for, you can be sure I am a fan of because we have whitelisted advertising on this program. I won't read the ad unless I actually like it. So when the e-cigarette company called or this other company that was sort of a scam, like protecting your serial number, your social security number, like they were like, oh my God, we love Jason, we love the show. Can you do this thing? And I was like, oh really? You want me to read that commercial for that company that protects your identity and your social security number? And the guy who released it his social security number got actually hacked? <laughs> no. I, I worked too hard for this. What little reputation I have left, I worked too hard for it. I'm trying to save. Trying I'm not reading you. an ad for that company. And, I just uh, hope you appreciate. I think this is the only time I've been on the show, and I have not mocked you as you've read the ads. Oh, good. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> is that part of the show? Is that, should it's I be making fun of It's a little bit of a shtick. It's yeah. to make fun of me when Usually, I'm doing yeah. the ad. <laughs> All right. Listen, uh, well, I want to go, uh, before we go to lunch of the week, let's just talk about the Tom Perkins thing, since that's so awesome. Um, obviously, we all know Tom Perkins wrote a bizarre letter to the editor where he complained about Daniel Steele's latest novel or a hedge or something. But more importantly... Without saying that was his ex-wife. Without saying I his know. ex-wife. <laughs> sort of a little bit of an omission there. The greatest um, celebrity of San Francisco. The greatest celebrity of San Francisco. We'll get yeah. to that. Tony but, Bennett is pissed. Yeah, yeah Tony <laughs> Bennett is like... But Chris, I mean, he basically says, is a pro progressive crystal not coming? Um, I could would call attention to the parallels of Nazi Germany to its war on its 1%, in quotes, namely its Jews, to the progressive war on the American 1%, namely the rich. Um, what, when, Sarah, when you read this, at what point did you realize this person had a disconnect with reality? Not to bias well, the question. I mean, he's, he's had a disconnect with reality for quite some time. I mean, he has been a guy, who, you know, a rich dude who like literally helped found the industry. I mean, Tandem was one of the gutsiest bet the firm. If that had gone under, there would be no Kleiner Perkins. Like, you know, love him or hate him, weirdo or not, like he is one of the founders of the venture capital industry. But, you know, he's been saying weird shit, doing weird shit for a long time. And like the firm has been steadily distancing themselves for, from him for a long time. So, you know, I wasn't hugely surprised, but I, I guess I was most surprised the journal would publish it. I mean, I know the journal's editorial page is very right wing, but it's just so disrespectful to say, I mean, no one feels sorry for hugely rich people, first of all. And even if you are gonna invoke sympathy for hugely rich people, you just don't compare them to something like the Holocaust. You don't compare them to a genocide. Like, did the, was the journal just thinking this will be great link bait and we don't really care what happens to- Well, what do you think? Do you think it was like some person who actually did think, hey, this is great for traffic and didn't think of the offensiveness of no. it? Do you think it was somebody who, well, I don't put that past somebody, but what do you think, Well, Sarah? I think it would happen to be how do you not see the offensiveness of it i mean how do you not see the all right now Gabe, what do you think did you see the follow-up today or yesterday yes, on the journal yesterday. i mean they, 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 they doubled down they doubled down they right. said okay maybe the holocaust imagery was 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 um what was it it was um provocative albeit um or uh, unfortunate albeit provocative was that was what they said unfortunate about the, 
kind of understating how unfortunate it was. Yeah. How about wildly disrespectful? Absolutely. I mean, yeah. At an entire. I think I think the reason the journal published it is because it, it, Perkins is not alone in this in this idea. I think it's crazy. I mean, no, we to have published the mo- something showing that rich people have invoked this for years. That's oh. the crazy thing. Yeah. Gabriel's absolutely right. This isn't even new. And, and and there's something. I mean, the thing that I don't understand, not being part of the one percent, not being a you know hundred millionaire, yet. not yet, is that I. I don't understand this victim complex that you know yeah. seeing the most powerful the wealthiest people yeah. and which are the most powerful people right. also see themselves as the victims of this what this mob that's uh, outside their house i mean the thing that he is tapping into is this rich person's paranoia that takes very very mild discussion about income inequality and turns it into oh my god they're going to round me up and and shoot all my family i mean that disconnect you know set aside well, by the way if they're going to you just made yourself public enemy number one. Oh, I, Even if that is your paranoia, don't then publish something that's calling it out. Like, I think there are other people who think this. They're just not yeah. stupid enough to put their name on it and put it in the Okay, journal. well, let's like, think realistically. Issues here. The, the, the rational version yeah. that the Wall Street Journal did in their follow-up, they called this, they said that while he, he the Nazi imagery was unfortunate, um, he did bring light to uh, the economic class warfare that's going on in our country. Yeah, I mean, anyone who thinks we, that we have class warfare going on right now, that's yeah, what insane. It, what would be the top um, warfare kind of moment? I mean, we did see... Um, I do think there is the class Occupy, warfare going the, there, there was the Occupy Wall Street movement, which felt like a fall, false start, but you did see in Occupy Wall Street people breaking windows, people going outside of Bloomberg's mansion or townhouse. So you did see a little bit of a bubble up, obviously not of sure. Crystal Knock, but of civil disobedience against rich people. Well, but I think I think you see the extremes basically encouraging each side, right? right. I mean, the, the Perkins the Perkins rhetoric, and it's not just Perkins, it's 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 a small group of, of wealthy yeah. individuals. And then you see, you know, the a small group of protesters that are connected to the Occupy yep. and they want to engage in the radicalism. I mean, you want to see class warfare, go look at you know Russia in nineteen seventeen. I mean that's what class warfare looks like. This is not, you know, a, a, a discourse on the web is not is not what you know riots well, there are people protesting Google buses in San Francisco. There are people going to people's houses and, you know, kind of freaking out people's kids. I mean, uh, frankly, explain like, that I, I situation, am a little Sarah. concerned with what's going on. Yes, yeah, so well, explain this, that, this, Sarah. This Sarah, Sarah, explain that one. Mm-hmm. What, what happened with the visiting of a Googler's house? This is somebody who made Street View and they yeah, went to his I house? I think he worked on the self-driving car and some other stuff. And they, you know, I mean, look, it was not like a mob. Well, there describe what happened. Like extreme yeah. that happened. I mean, I think it was just a couple people who printed out leaflets saying he wanted to condoize all of Berkeley and kind of camped out and made some noise and went away. Like, you know, I don't think it was extreme, but it's like what, what pissed me off about it is like this guy's carrying his kid out to the car and, you know, this is going on. They're harassing his neighbors. I mean, yeah. it's like, come on, leave people's families out of this. I think what we've written about about and what I think is bullshit about this class war and people making whip trying to whip up a class war because I do agree with you there are people trying to whip this up more than it is an organic thing um, is that it's being waged against people who are just working for these tech companies it's frequently not taking on any of the people who are billionaires or who are huge investors or whatever and I think that's what was so damaging about someone from the tech world like Perkins, who most people from the outside don't know the fact that he is not an active venture capitalist anymore and doesn't have a connection really to his firm anymore. Um, He goes out and says that and it just throws fire on all this, you know, people from the other side have been trying to whip this thing up. I was super impressed that immediately other people started distancing themselves. Yeah. You know, Mark Andreessen immediately tweeted, you know, he has not been a venture capital in 20 years. Kleiner Perkins itself said- Is Kleiner Perkins going to remove- Is Kleiner Perkins going to remove Perkins from their name Mark's after this? Mark's sister said that they should just go by Kleiner, you know, or Ooh. Casey- KCP. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's not a bad idea, but you know, you know, the one person, the only VC that I saw defending him, do you know who it was, Jason? Let me think about that. I'm trying to think <laughs> of somebody who's a. And I didn't read everything. It was the only one I saw publicly I, defending him. I have no idea. Michael Arrington. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think. <laughs> Wow. I'm not joking. <laughs> Listen, if... Um, so other people are toned up as well. Well, talking about... We're talking about rich people who have a paranoia complex. I mean, right? I mean, who believe they're 
prosecuted, persecuted yeah. when in fact they may be the persecutors. Like, I mean, I think that speaks volumes. So leave it at that. Um, all right, listen, let's go to the launch <laughs> of the week. All right. Yes, this is the Bing launch of the week. Thanks to, thank you, thank you to my friends at Bing for making a great search engine and, uh, which actually is my default on my tablet. And it is not. I swear to God, it is. I'll go get it and I'll show you. I did that on purpose because I, I'll tell you what. I always want to know what the difference is between products. Mm -hmm. So like on one device it's Google, another device is Bing, another device is this, that. I always like to try all different things. Anyway, thanks to our friends at Bing. Uh, listen, Facebook has launched a Flipboard knockoff called. Paper. Let's watch the video here for a moment. And I think I can talk over this. Here you go. So You're looking at headlines. Your You're going stories. through some sort of wheel. And then you flip stuff up and you put those categories into your feed. You like tech. You like whatever. You like the planet. You like headlines. And uh, then you can read a full story from Time Magazine, I guess, or maybe a portion of it. And I think you can post your own stories into it. You can obviously use it in, when you have candles in your bathroom, which is the use case for. That was a great one. <laughs> I wonder, is that a little? Is that a little pandering? It's like a woman in a bathtub with candles, looking at a. Was she looking Very at a sonogram? Provocative. Yes, she was looking at her sonogram. Yeah. Sarah. Well, I mean, I guess that was you just shortly ago, right? That was you're a. Me. You're a tech savvy That's what I did woman. Every night. <laughs> Absolutely. You get there to the end of the night, and you're like, you know, it'd be great is if Mark Zuckerberg would light some candles in my bathroom <laughs> and send me some sonogram images for me but, to look but, at. But it's, but it's on brand, right? Because the, 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 that moment, it's basically the spa. This is, the, this is what the, the Facebook, uh, the paper, and, yeah. and even Flipboard are going after, is they're trying to say, oh, you're in a hectic world. Let's go to the spa, which is not real life. It's somewhere that you want to be in some place that you visit kind of infrequently. Right. So Sarah, what did you think of this launch? Um, I mean, it's more of the same with Facebook. I mean, ever since they went public, the only way they quote unquote innovate is trying to rip off someone else and put it in their context. I think one thing that might be interesting about it um, is if they're trying to get more in the news consumption, news reading space, which has obviously heavily been Twitter's domain, and I think it makes sense, watch out every company that uses Facebook for viral because we have now seen about four generations of Facebook platform rules getting rewritten and companies who made their money and made their traffic on the Facebook platform getting completely fucked over. If I were Upworthy or BuzzFeed or any of these companies and I see Facebook launching anything that's about consuming news, I am going to immediately get panicked and start coming up with a backup plan. So you're, you believe that all this Upworthy and BuzzFeed traffic that's being sucked off, they might actually then go to them like they did to Zynga and Mark Pincus and say, hey, you want to get our traffic, you got to pay us now and change the rules because that's the rule flipping you're referring to. Yep. I mean, Viddy, uh, I like back in the day, Slide. Like, I mean, we have seen over and over again on the Facebook platform. We did a huge investigative piece on it last year. Um, companies that rely on the rules from Facebook platform and think they've found this magic way to unlock distribution, you know, getting fucked over. I mean, you've certainly experienced this with Google. Yeah. And so what is the approach i uh do you think google uh, facebook will eventually learn like hey if we want people to long-term value our platform we should allow them to trust us or do you think that that hasn't gotten through to senior management they haven't so far and look at their earnings yesterday they're doing great i don't think they think they need it interesting mm -hmm. uh okay let's I mean, go to the Apple next didn't. Apple never was super respectful of developers well now with the Department. with the app store they seem to have learned their lesson it's like 70 percent you get, which is a pretty great percentage. And uh, they curate it, so they make sure that if somebody is ripping off your product now, they'll even police it on your behalf. I mean, it does seem like Apple is really they've trying. They've gotten better. They've gotten much better, I think. Okay, let's go to the next one. Pocket Size Gaming Ready PC raises 200000 uh, on a $100,000 Indiegogo goal. Can we see that video? Is it a video? We or is it not a video? Tango to oh, there it goes. Built so here it is, Tango. World of laptops, tiny laptops, little box. Users just one Good looking founder. I liked him on, uh, ever been possible. what was he on? Tango Family something? Streamline yeah. everything yeah. From your You're kind of creepy. Your yeah, that, I, it's creepy when I talk over the things. I can't see the videos. So I just oh, okay. can't It's basically a really good looking guy. And then people are taking this little tiny box that looks like a battery charger and putting it in their really bespoke like uh, hoodie. And then the dude's plugging it into the base and he can take his 
uh, gaming platform wherever he goes to his friend's house and it's everything. Thank God. It's, it's the it's the uh, it's it's your work, your everything. I mean, so. Tango is the size of an external drive just to put the things there, plugged into a dock at work or home. Entire PC is there. It runs Windows or Linux, so it's the entire PC in a little tiny box. Yeah, no um, need for a PlayStation, Xbox. So no or... need for a separate laptop or tower computer, but it doesn't have a screen on it, obviously. Right. What do you think, Gabe? It feels, I mean, it, it'd be great. I'd love to have the same yeah. device and be able to take you know, my laptop, plug it into my TV, and watch Netflix. I mean, that's, yeah. that sounds great. It also feels kind of transitional, doesn't it? I mean, we're going to a place where everything is coming in from the streaming cloud. in from the cloud, yeah. and and we're trying to get away from having this hardware to, to lug around. But you know, um, if it if it lived up to it, I, I'd give it a shot. I, it requires Windows. I'm kind of a Mac guy, so that's that, that would be my drawback. It does seem like the power of the um, iPhone or just these devices. At some point, we should be able to just take these, mm -hmm. lay them on a inductive charging thing with a keyboard and a mouse and use that as your computer. Right, right. I, and I, I think that's what they're going for. I mean, I've seen a couple of these that they're yeah. trying to do that. But well, this thing also has the graphics processing power for hardcore gamers. Right. That's the sort of crazy hook here. Right, right. Interesting. Uh, Sarah, any thoughts on this? I, I mean, sounds interesting. I can't say I've been wishing for this, you <laughs> yeah. know, every day. <laughs> like, I mean, that's I'm, sort I'm of one of... demographic. <laughs> it is one of the things about... <laughs> I love about Indiegogo and Kickstarter is that you get stuff that you there is not a mark a large market right, for. Right, right. You get stuff that there's a medium market for that's just bizarre. Well, and you look. I mean, they raised double their goal. I mean, some people are out there. You might not be interested. I wasn't. I haven't been saying this is what I want, but capture the imagination. So I think it's more interesting than the Facebook thing. I mean, look, they're doing something new. They're yeah. doing something that's technologically hard, and they're you know putting it out there, and people are saying they want it. Yeah. It's more interesting than the Facebook launch. I mean, if we are real-time ranking as we go along. Sure. All right, here, this is crazy, uh, this next one. This is the Durr faceless watch. I got it up on my screen here. It does not have a, a watch face. I kid you not. It just vibrates every five minutes and tells you how much closer to death you are. That's not their pitch. That's mine. Uh, sleek, <laughs> faceless design. It looks like jewelry. There's no screen, no notifications, just a vibration every five minutes when activated. The initial alpha units were constructed on a small scale, pieced together, and died by hand. The new Durs are being released, uh, redesigned to enable larger price sale, hopefully for resulting in a price. Um, this is just bizarre and interesting. What do you think, Gabriel? I think it's a Rorschach test on your personality. Right. If this is appealing to you, you're basically someone who is always is thinking, how can I get more productive? I am wasting time, whereas I think the other part of society is saying, oh my God, I'm working so hard. How can I work faster? Having uh, uh, this thing, basically, you said it, it, it buzzes every five minutes, right? So it basically just says, you know that thing you're doing? You just wasted five minutes. Why aren't you finished yet? Can you imagine having someone on your shoulder saying that every few seconds? I know. It's like my mom. Uh, yeah. I'm watching the Knicks game, and she's like, five minutes for the Knicks? How about your homework? Five, exactly. 15 minutes for the Knicks? When are you going to do? get up and do some exercise? And also, it's a buzz. It kind of feels like a, a electro. For me, it sounds like an electro charge, like, you know, kind of getting zapped every five minutes. Yeah. Now the guy, uh, I forget who, who who did the review at the Verge. Um, he did. Uh, he said he really enjoyed it. That he felt like it, it it made him more efficient and 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 it it he got more out of his life, I guess, by saying, "Oh, I've been playing around writing this post, and I should have been, you know, doing something else." I don't know. I I I, I think it maybe it's a it's a a very acquired taste. Yeah, this is just obviously like one of those like sort of dude projects, but. Um, I wonder. I'll, like, I'll say this yeah. though. I think it looks pretty. It I is mean, very I pretty. I wish, you know, I wish someone like Fitbit or the Up would design something that looked more like this. I mean, if it had a more practical function like that, I would love it. I mean, I think, um, you know, I think wearing something on my wrist every day, like, you know, if it looks, you know, if it looks cool, then that's great. I mean, I, you know, I wore it up for a while. I had two. They both broke. I stopped wearing them. You know, so it's like I, I feel like I have a place on my wrist for something that's functional. I just don't think, you know, this is a very. I mean, I'm going to show my English major roots here. This is like that line in the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, where it's like measuring your life by coffee spoons. Like I don't think I want to be measure my measuring my life by five minute increments. Like I'm the opposite. When I go to yoga, I put my back to where the clock is because like I don't want to be watching the clock because it'll make it feel longer. Do either but of you... I hope the designers do something cool because yeah. I like the look of it. Do either of you wear a watch? 
I, I don't wear a watch. No. I, 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 the last time I wore a watch was probably 1990. I mean, right. I, I, I can't. It, to graduation? It, yeah, probably. High school graduation? <laughs> I can't imagine. I, it, it, it would feel weird on my on my wrist. I, this is the thing that's I've been holding me back from the it, Fitbit. Though. I was wearing the the up and I loved it. If it didn't keep breaking, I would still be wearing it. Yeah, I did that. I did that for a while. The I did the Nike Fuel Band. But what I really want is a device that will give me my heart rate throughout the day, mm -hmm. as well as the pedometer, as well as I really want to know my like blood sugar and glucose level and all that stuff. Because from what I understand, this is an amazing predictor. Those two things, heart rate and your blood sugar, are like massive predictors of all kinds of things in your life, including mm -hmm. death and depression and anxiety and sleep and everything. I want something that, but it's hard to get the blood, the glucose level in the blood without piercing your skin. Yeah. <laughs> but I understand that's do you, coming. Do you need someone to tell you when you're depressed or having anxiety? Not really, but I think it would just be good to know your pattern during the day. Like when, th that sure. was the thing. Like I kind of feel like for diet too. You'd probably say, thinking, say like, like oh, oh, I'm low blood sugar. Yeah, this is why I'm going to eat that crap food. Exactly. Like I'm low blood sugar or by the way, yeah. your sugar is off the charts. Like yeah. what, are you drinking a bunch of coffee yeah. or what's going on with the, you know, your heart rate's going up just to have an idea to baseline. Yeah. Cause I got the my I don't know if you remember the my you put, it's a stupid thing you put on the top of your head. The company went out of business. But you put it on the top of your head, and it's reading your brain <laughs> waves, <laughs> and you sleep, and it records your sleep patterns, uh -huh. and it's a great thing to do for two weeks, uh -huh. because yeah. after like five or ten days, you understand. The bulldogs are climbing on top of you and farting and waking you up. Your daughter is coming in at six thirty, waking up. There's some like garbage truck, whatever it is. Right. You know, like, and then you take action on what you learned, and then you see it go down, and you can measure it, you can manage it. But I like that kind of like. 10 day yeah. cycle. Well, that's what I liked about, that's what I liked about the up yeah. with the buzzing is it was like when I was idle for 30 minutes, it would buzz. And then I would get up and do a call when I was walking around. Like that was really, really useful. Oh, does it do and, that? Although it, it does. But the, the problem with the up with the sleeping, I thought that would be fascinating. It does not work. Mm. Like I would, I had a brand new baby and I was getting up constantly with a stupid pacifier back in her mouth and it'd be like, you only woke up twice. And I was like, bullshit, who's risking <laughs> oh, Not mine. <laughs> exactly. All right, that's it. Here we go. So we have three. The launch, uh, Facebook launches yet another clone of some other startup. It's called Paper. It's just like Flipboard. Uh, a pocket-sized gaming PC uh, that people are going crazy for on Indiegogo and a faceless watch that will um, annoy you every five minutes and uh, make you realize how much closer to death you are. Uh, Gabe, which one was your favorite, Gabriel? Um, of these... Your, launch, I, your Bing launch of the week now. I would go with Tango. I, I think I, I'd like to give that a shot of uh, living off of one box. That, 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 that Of these three, sure. Interesting. Okay. And uh, Sarah, which well, one was your I favorite? Thank you I want to thank you for not putting something funded by Elon in this category. I feel like every time I come on, there's something that Elon produced, and the other ones are like, why were they even in a competition yeah. with like a rocket? What do you um, think of the grasshopper, <laughs> which can land itself and go sideways and hover versus, <laughs> like a Star Wars vehicle? Uh, <laughs> versus. So I'm going to be different, and I'm going to oh, look say, at the picture. Um, we got this now. This is the new thing. Anytime anybody evokes Elon Musk, you have to put the picture of him as Dr. Elon. <laughs> <laughs> so, actually, we could have done the cross-country rally. Yeah. Elon did launch this week a charging station that lets you drive from New York to L.A. For free. Put that, should have put that in launch of the week. We uh, well, we would have won. All right, what's your choice? <laughs> what's your choice? Um, I'm going to say Durr okay. because I think that they're going to do – I think wearables is super interesting, and I think no one has done it on a stylish level, and I think this will be sort of a, a first version that's not that interesting that allows these guys who clearly have a design sensibility and different lens on it from the Silicon Valley norm to do something really cool for their next act. I, uh, I'm going to go with Dur as well because I do think it's a starting point and I think they're going to add three or four other types of vibrations to it, like a double vibration for this and a triple vibration for that or whatever. And I think it could become like a very interesting way. You realize to we could build this today uh, with like Radio Shack parts, right? Absolutely. That's the, that's the, that's what's, it's bespoke. All right. Listen, <laughs> that's the whole it's idea. Still better. <laughs> Okay, so, Gabriel, do you think the Dura is better than the Facebook launch? I mean, can we all agree the Facebook launch? Yeah, the, the, the least thinking it, it, for originality, I give it to them for yeah. sure. I mean, the thing with, I, I listen. I wish Facebook great luck with their with their with paper, and I wish them as much success as they had with Poke. <laughs> <laughs> and competing with Snapchat. Well and, done. And places their Foursquare ripoff. And yeah. It's and their what was their? And... They had a Groupon ripoff too. All oh, right. I can't remember. Well, if it's it, Facebook, it was, it was oh Quora. Like they had a Quora one. Oh right. They ripped they off did. Quora for a couple yeah, of months because yeah. they were upset that those guys left. And they ripped off. Um, 
They did Foursquare. Foursquare was the other, like you said. Yeah, yeah, places. All right, listen, this has been amazing. Uh, great job, everybody. And uh, I'm going to let uh, Gabriel go. I feel like go. I was so much more respectful to you than I usually am, Jason. That's because you don't I, have. I need to get a little more pissed off next time. Uh -huh. You don't have the little devil next to you. You're, you're the little pixie <laughs> on your shoulder. Next to me. I know. He's, he's going right. to jump <laughs> into the shot. He'll be like, what? What is Kyle Kellis doing? Oh, look at him. He's pounding away on his. Blackberry Q10. There he is on the Q10. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here he comes. Oh, no. All right, Gabe. All right. Great week. I'll see you uh, in New York. Gabe's going to get out of here. All right. Paul Carr's going to come you. into shot. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Oh, my God. Not Paul Carr. What is With like. That, I'm out of here. Exactly. I wonder what <laughs> life is like. Too. I wonder what life is like at Pando Daly since Paul Carr joined, came in the building. It's got to be a lot more fun, I would think. It, yeah, I get a lot of hate mail. Hey, speaking of like hate mail and people hating you guys, you wrote this really great investigative piece about um, the uh, price fixing. Uh, what'd you call it? You called it wage limiting? Yeah, the Tectopus. Yeah, but yeah. What, what was the, it was a, you guys, what I like about Mark Ames and some of the other folks you have from the Pandodale, from the um, Not Safe for Work acquisition is they come up with their own words to describe stuff. It was called something, wage limiting or we wage. You said, could. I think we just said conspirated to drive down wages in the headline. Yeah, but there was a word um, like wage something. It. My favorite thing. Yeah. Wage cap limiting. Wage fixing? I think it was wage fixing. It might have been wage fixing. But anyway. Um, I like that he, I like the whole thing of the uh, tectopus, this idea of this eight-armed tech octopus that was aggressively <laughs> driving down salaries. That was amazing. Yeah. So t tell me, tell everybody about that piece and you know, what goes well, into the, how much work goes into a piece like that? And what is the ramification of doing that piece? Because I noticed that piece did not appear on other tech blogs. Yeah. And the amazing thing is the court documents were out there. Other people could have done this piece. I mean, this is one of the things that when you prioritize this kind of reporting, you know, you give people time to, you know, sometimes you get scoops and you get leaks, but sometimes this stuff's just out there and it just takes the time and dedication to do it right. Basically, there's been this class action suit for a while that, um, that, Google, Apple, Intuit, Adobe, I mean, a lot of these major tech companies were actively working and colluding with one another to keep, to keep tech wages down. And the most amazing thing that Mark did in the story was pull out all of these personal emails between these guys. And the most damning, for sure, were from Steve Jobs. There's a whole section of the story where it shows him effectively bullying Bruce Chisholm, who was the CEO of, of Adobe at the time, to you know really enforce this. Uh, people from Google were firing recruiters that they would go after these sort of protected workers from these other companies. And one of my favorite things was in an email, Eric Schmidt saying, let's not put this in email. You know, I mean, they knew yeah. what they were doing was wrong. They knew they shouldn't have put it down. And Google, a company that profits off reading our emails, <laughs> did not think, don't put this in email. I mean, it totally gives you a different view of these two-dimensional heroes and legends of the tech world. It's sort of like when, uh, yeah, when, when you get the call, like, hey, listen, I think this line might be tapped, so let's not talk about the murder, okay? Because I, right. I think they're listening in. Um, wage theft just, agreements was what you guys called it, by the way. The wage theft agreements, yeah. <laughs> well, and it's, you know, this is, in terms of what goes into these stories, I mean, this is what's great about having someone like Mark Ames on staff, you know, I won't, I won't hear from him for weeks, and then he'll just pop up with something like this, and it's like, holy shit. Yeah. And my understanding from Paul is that he's doing another similar holy shit story now. He's disappeared for a week or so, so stay so tuned. This, he'll um, pop up and blow what, our minds again. What, what happens to you? What, what kind of blowback do you get uh, when you publish something like this, if any, because the, the documents are out there, but it does seem like, oh my God, like they're, other people did not cover this story. Just like there's some other yeah. stories, like there was um, one of these apps, I think it was Scout, um, where ch children were molested or raped, you know, because they were people, it was like one of these location networks that was proximity networks that was aimed at children, like kids, mm -hmm. and these 12 and 13 year olds were using it. They got stalked and they wound up getting raped. We have to check the facts on that, but I believe it was Scout. But it, they really don't get covered, these stories, sometimes by the tech press. What happens to you and your brand when you cover something like this so, you know, you get your teeth into it? Or do you hear not hear anything I mean, from I anybody? 
so I think it's great for our brand. I mean, I think our brand is increasingly becoming, and I think you've seen this in some sense since the early days, but over the last six months, for sure, you know, we're the place that asks a lot of hard questions. You know, we're the place that gets enough into a Twitter fight with Pierre Midiar about how his new company is going to cover eBay. I mean, the stuff we've covered on Uber background checks, you know, we showed them their background checks weren't good. We showed them someone had a criminal record they didn't check, you know. So I think increasingly that's why people come to our site, because they feel like we're asking these hard questions and we're holding tech giants, even the ones we really respect, accountable. Hmm. But I think in terms of blowback, you know, the thing I was worried about when I read this story of drafts is that um, Bill Campbell, who to so many people is this sort of avuncular, you know, amazing figure in the Valley that people just adore, he was really a big part of this whole plot. That's what these emails and documents show. I thought I would get blowback from all the Bill Campbell fans. I didn't hear a word. I think it was so obvious. And I think that when you do takedowns or you do investigative pieces, you got to do them really well. And if you do them really well, we don't get any blowback because there's nothing people can say. Yeah, it was it was really interesting how he was, I guess, you know, on all these different boards and was, I guess, being the communication vehicle for this price fixing scheme. Do you think it actually resulted in people making less money? Because you do see on the counter this who, huge war going on for talent. So yeah. did this really work or was it a strategy that worked for a time and then ultimately failed and maybe went away when Steve Jobs passed? Yeah, I think it's probably a little bit of both. I think it definitely worked for a time. And I think, you know, it's hard to disprove a negative. So it's hard for us to know how much bigger wages could have got. But I actually wrote a follow-up piece to Mark's piece um, that was basically saying the reason this didn't work as well as they would like is because the nature of Silicon Valley and the tech business, you know, Facebook wasn't in this plot. LinkedIn wasn't in this plot. Twitter wasn't in this plot. Zynga wasn't. I mean, we, you always have these new multi-billion dollar companies getting created. So, you know, even though Apple and Google are certainly still powerful companies, they don't have the lock on the industry the way, say, all of the five biggest investment banks would if they tried to do something like this. Or, you know, the big railroads and the robber baron days. I mean, the nature of technology where we encourage and our whole economy is predicated on the young eating the old and getting, you know, even bigger than these companies, it means that, you know, no one this kind of corruption can't have the same impact it would have in other industries. I mean, when we started really seeing wages rising aggressively, it was when Zuckerberg and Eric Schmidt were fighting over individuals. Remember, it was Facebook coming yeah. in who just started bidding crazy amounts. It's because Facebook was the big one not in this group. So, yeah. I mean, I think that's why they weren't as effective as they wanted to be. But I think the fact that those Facebook hires and poachings were so outrageous and were considered so extreme and got so much news several years ago. I think that's because this was working up until then. All right, listen, moving on, we'll get through the couple of just quick stories here between Sarah and I. Uh, Google sells Motorola to Lenvio for $2.9 billion. They bought Motorola Mobility for $12.5 billion. Uh, they're paying, um, and by the way, that's the second big move for Lenvio. They, um, had also bought IBM's lower end server business. So everybody seems to be dumping, I guess, like the ThinkPad business, uh, the low commodity or the, the smaller businesses in, in handsets and servers and laptops to them. Um, but what, but uh, Google says it is retaining some of the uh, hardware engineers. And is there a connection to Nest with this? What, what do you think, Sarah? Well, I mean, I think. Uh I would hope that whatever Google's going to do in hardware is going to be connected to Nest somehow because, you know, Tony Fidel and his team are, you know, some of the smarter hardware thinkers. I mean, I kind of feel like no one's really understood ever why Google bought Motorola. And I feel like for the last, you know, however long since that deal happened, people keep coming up with theories and like, oh, well, maybe it was this, maybe the it patents. was this. And like, the patents, yeah, the right? patents, but beyond the patents, like, were they going to launch new phones? Were they going to? I mean, it's like there's always been these crazy theories. And, I mean, it seems like, you know, hey, the patents were part of it. They got some hardware talent. And, like, you know, Google is sort of woken up to what everyone's been saying, that it didn't really need the rest of the company. Yeah, interesting. Um, and I guess, you know, when you are got that much, that money printing machine, you don't really need to worry if you make a mistake. So uh, next up. And it's nice that they can can admit they made a mistake. I mean, that's one of the things I like about Google. You know, they don't, I don't feel like they, as a company, feel like they have to dig their heels in and keep with a strategy that didn't work. Yeah, they're just like, whatever, we're, cut, we're cutting our losses, get back $3 billion and then let's, let's move on. Hey, um, Box is uh, filing for their IPO in uh, secret filing. Um, they've raised $400 million since 2005. 
and recently a hundred million at a two billion dollar uh, valuation. They got twenty million users, ninety seven percent of the Fortune five hundred. Uh, any thoughts on Box and their IPO? Does this mean we're going to see a Dropbox IPO shortly thereafter? So I have a ton of thoughts on this. I've, I've been talking to a bunch of people, and I think everyone knew that they were thinking about going next summer. So this isn't a huge surprise. Um, I think you know, Box is in some ways as sort of wacky as Aaron Levy is. Like he really has studied old school enterprise software masters, and all these guys knew that basically when you're selling to huge companies, you got to get out and be public because people want to feel like you are trusted, like you've got resources. I mean, and what the meaning of an IPO for an enterprise? company is completely different than the meaning of an enterprise for a consumer company. And I think that's why you see Box doing this comparatively quickly. Now, I think Dropbox still considers itself primarily a consumer company. So there's not the same value to them going public immediately as there is to Box. I definitely dug in, uh, dug around a little bit with some banking sources last week to figure out, you know, where Dropbox's plans were. You know, they just did that mega round, which sometimes can mean they're putting off an IPO, sometimes can mean that um, they're getting ready for one. And the, the thing that I heard from everyone was that Dropbox, you know, whether we agree or not, they really genuinely don't see uh, Box as a direct competitor editor and they're going to stick with their own timeline and they don't give a shit when box goes so i right. doubt we see c1 because of this i think the companies are still trying to run their own races yeah it does feel that way although they did announce that they're giving 50 gigs away per phone or something it was like whoa that's a lot i was kind of nuts it's uh, gonna be fun to see aaron as a public company ceo like the yeah. sheer entertainment factor i'm looking forward to this ipo yeah it is uh, interesting okay yeah and then closing up the week zynga acquired uh an app studio natural motion for a half billion dollars is a huge huge deal they're also laying off uh, about 15 percent of their workforce which is staggeringly 300 people they got a lot of people at zynga still um and um zynga stock price went up a little bit and it seems like they're kind of riding the ship over there and getting out of the Facebook world, as painful as it is, pretty quickly and getting into the mobile games world. What do you think? Zynga going to be here for the long term? I just don't get gaming companies. I mean, it seems like they're so inherently fad based. It seems like they're big and then yeah. they hire up and they buy things and then it's disappointing. Like, I mean, it, I'm not the demographic. I don't play a lot of Zynga yeah. games, but like, I mean, I, I worry the same thing about them that I do about Rovio and Supercell and all these guys. Like, I just, I, I have yet to have anyone make a great compelling argument for why gaming is a great investment. Like, remember Dots? Remember we were all obsessed with Dots? What's, uh, yeah, no, ago? now like, Dots is over. I have that in forever. Right. Yeah, the shelf life seems to be pretty quick, unless you have these massively multiplayer games like we have World of Warcraft or yeah, where it's some a whole of these. subculture. Do yeah. you invest in gaming companies? I I have not. I looked, I wanted to invest in um, uh, Quiz Up, but it, it moved a little bit too fast for me to get there. But generally, I stay away from gaming companies music companies and health companies all for the same reason um i i don't know enough about those spaces to make them worth at work and then two of the three the one is because of the fat issue and the two of the other three are you know you got those incumbents who will just destroy yeah. these companies the music I, I like i see all these great music things and i'm like i would love to invest in that except it's going to go out of business when the music industry decides right. it doesn't deserve it. and the same with healthcare, it's like too too long of a runway i don't know all right, listen, this has been a great episode. Thank you so much to Gabriel Snyder uh, for joining Inside.com. And, uh, and then running away. Where did he go? He's got to catch a plane. He's, he's going to back oh. to New York. He came out for the week <laughs> for the launch. You know, the editorial will be largely based in New York for Inside. And uh, Oh, and thanks for the piece by... Um, um, Adam. Adam. Yeah, Pennenberg did a really interesting inside i didn't even it was a big surprise he did like a couple thousand word piece on inside the brain of jason calacanis which and it was funny when i saw that i was like why is he writing this like jason yeah. didn't even give us the exclusive on his stupid fucking company i gave no one the exclusive i'm a professional doing a panda monthly where we we're inside his where we, where we were inside his brain do we need to be inside his brain? but i love the story i actually got a lot out of it i thought it was super well written well, of course, Pennenberg is great. It was fun. I was very flattered, so thank you for that. And, uh, you know, I, I, did, I, I can't believe I was able to keep this whole thing under wraps, but I was pretty careful to not give anybody uh, an exclusive. Paul was pissed because you told him all about it, and he was careful not to say a damn word. I told him, and I, I explicitly told him not to tell you. I was he like, did. Sarah That's will just fire. Pa, 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 pa. Sarah will just fire. Pa, 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 pa. <laughs> No, I, I showed him a little bit, but we, we kept it under wraps. So anyway, long way to go. But um, hey, everybody. Well, congrats. Go it's always a huge effort. 
Yeah, it's great. I'm really proud of the team, actually. They, a lot of sleepless nights went into it. So um, go check out Inside.com. This is my plug. Uh, hey, listen, everybody follow Sarah Kuda uh, and Gabriel Snyder on Twitter. And those are their handles. And go to pandodaily.com. And uh, you got a conference coming up to plug? We do in June. We just put we just announced our first lineup of speakers, which includes a fireside chat with Al Gore. Which oh, I'm wow. very excited about cool. on the board of Apple, special advisor to Google, um, has won an Oscar. I mean, he's sort of played in every power center in the United States. So I'm really excited about that one. We've also got Phil Libin, um, uh, David Marcus, the president of PayPal, who's a fascinating guy and doesn't speak very much. A um, bunch more people we haven't announced yet. It's going to be an amazing conference in partnership with Bonnaroo. So there's going to be live music curated by Bonnaroo in the evenings of the conference, Southern food, whiskey. It's in Nashville this summer. We're only selling 600 tickets total, and um, I think we've already sold a pretty good chunk of those. So yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tickets on sale. I'm gonna come out for come it. Up. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna come out for it. Hey, listen and look at this. Look at this lineup you have. Uh, San Francisco, uh, March 13th, Max Levchin, Howard Lindzen, who's awesome, uh, March 20th, and then Steve Case, a legend in New York on uh, March 27th. Mike Maples, you know what? That's interesting. You got Mike Maples because he doesn't like to do stuff, does he? He, you know what? I asked him. Him and I kind of thought he would say no because he doesn't like to do stuff. And he was like, oh, I've been waiting for you to ask me. I have so much stuff I've never talked about I want to talk about. People good are get. increasingly seeing Panda Monthly as therapy sessions. Good good get. Good get. It was good Thanks. for me. Yeah, Bijan uh, in New York. He's a great get. Jeff Wiener. Wow. That's a big, big get. And then, wow, the founder of Vice. We got a lot of Shane public Smith. company guys. Yeah, well, yeah, you know, it's great. I'm super excited about that one. Isn't it interesting as an industry, like we haven't had any publicly traded companies for close to a decade since the first dot-com bubble. So journalism and covering these things was like, there were no public companies. Just nobody was public <laughs> except for, you know, Zuckerberg. And now it's everybody's public. Yeah, so we've got Jeff Wiener. We've got, um, we've got also got Anil from yeah. Work Day, Anil Bushri. That's a huge one. That's a huge the one. enterprise world on fire. So it's going to yeah. be a great lineup this year. All right, listen, thanks also to Wistia and Mandrill, two great products I love. And, of course, Bing, 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 Bing. Thank you so much for sponsoring the program. Producer Gina. MailChimp. MailChimp. <laughs> and thank you for that. Uh, and that's it. We're going to wrap. Uh, everybody follow at TWI Startups and follow at Jason. Follow at Inside. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks, Sarah. <laughs>